And Michelle's here with me, and of course, Erica, she never left. She's uh, been here all the time. So uh, uh, you guys are family, and it's so wonderful just to have a chance to worship with you and to share uh, some thoughts with you on worship this morning. So let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 and 10b. This is King Solomon with all of Israel dedicating the very first temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord that filled it. When all of the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, his love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions, as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising the Lord, and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets, and all the Israelites were standing. King Solomon sent the people home to their, to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people, Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, one of the difficult things about worship is announcements. I mean, where do you put announcements in a worship service? It doesn't quite fit, right? So a lot of times, of course, we try to minimize the number of announcements we make in a worship service and put them in a bulletin. A bulletin sort of serves as a weekly newsletter. So I'd like to share with you a few church bloopers from actual church bulletins. Here's one. Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking tonight. Come and hear Bertha Belch all the way from Africa. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> a bean supper will be held on Tuesday night in the church hall. Music will follow. <laughs> Nothing like getting your Sunday morning rolling with a good fart joke, huh? Well, listen, I'm really glad to be here. So let's uh, just get on into this topic of worship. When Pastor Glenn asked me to preach on the topic of worship, the first thing that came to mind was this story of King Solomon dedicating the very first temple in Jerusalem. Because in this story, we see confirmed some of the things that you've already talked about. First of all, that worship is about God. Solomon prayed, and if you want to go back to your Bibles and look in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, there's a very lengthy prayer that Solomon prayed on his knees before the entire assembly of all of Israel while they were there to dedicate the temple to God's glory, a place for God's name to dwell on earth. Worship is about God. But we also learn that worship includes music. And in this story, we see that music is present. There's a means to praise the Lord, to worship him with our hearts and with our voices. All the musicians were in their place and the priests with their trumpets were there to lead the people in music to the Lord. But there's something else in this story that we might want to think about together. And that is this, that worship is community. Worship is community. This story reveals that the whole community of Israel came together to dedicate this new temple to the glory of God. And this story reveals some things about worshiping community. Worshiping community is bound to God and to each other through covenant. That each person in that community has a part to play and that we belong to God's redemptive story that continues to unfold throughout the world. The temple was built by Solomon it was actually envisioned by his father, King David, and inspired by the tabernacle that was built by Moses. The plan, if you look on this slide up here, uh, shows a little bit what the temple might have looked like. The plan included 
uh, some symbolism. The temple courts is where the priests offered the sacrifices. You see the burnt uh, offering being done right there in the temple court. But then when you go inside the temple, only priests could go in there, and that's where they offered incense and candlelight and laid out the showbread for the Lord. And in the back of the temple, there was this partitioned area with a veiled curtain, and in, behind that curtain lied the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of the Ark of the Covenant was the two stone tablets on which Moses had written the law. The Ten Commandments were on those stone tablets. And so that leads us to our first point. A worship community is bound to God and to each other. Bound to God and to each other through covenant. The Ten Commandments represent a covenant. It's an agreement between God and Israel. God bound himself to Israel, and Israel bound itself to God through this covenant that was given through Moses. So at the center of their temple, at the place they called the Holy of Holies, the, the inner sanctum of their worship space, lied these Ten Commandments, this law. What does that say about the identity of this worship community. I mean, it wasn't just stone tablets there. It was in a golden box covered with cherubim. And Solomon put that box, that Ark of the Covenant, between two towering cherubim as it set beneath their wings overshadowing the box. What does that say about their community? What are they trying to say? I think it's saying that their relationship with God and each other is at the center of their lives that it's their greatest treasure. Covenant is at the center of who they are as a community in the Lord. Think about what the Ten Commandments have to say about community. The first four commandments are about our relationship with God. Have no other gods before me. Don't worship idols. Don't make any statues or idols. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. Remember to keep the Sabbath holy. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, has to do with your relationships at home. Because our relationships at home primarily influence how we relate to the rest of the world. The last five commandments have to do with our relationship with our neighbors. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and do not covet. Our relationship with God flows through our relationships at home and then out to others. When you honor God through a life of worship, you show how your heart belongs to God. God blesses your obedience and you become a blessing to others. Now, we aren't Jews, so this law wasn't given to us directly. We belong to a new covenant, a new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are bound to God and to each other as a community in the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Our covenant is one of love. And our law is love. Love God with your whole self. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another so well that the world will believe what we have to say about Jesus Christ. Love is our covenant. As the law of Moses sat at the center of Israel's worshiping community, the love of Jesus Christ is at the center of ours. I mean, what's the most prominent symbol in this worship space? It's the cross. Right up behind us, right up there, right dead center, that cross represents our faith. That cross sets at the center of this community. That cross reminds us that the king of glory hung on that cross, dying a death that we deserve. Jesus said, greater love has no one than he who lays down his life for a friend. And Jesus has called each one of us friends, for he gave his life for us so that we might have eternal life. Worship is community. We are bound to God and we are bound to each other through the love of Jesus Christ. And in this community, each of us have a part to play. Each of us play our part in this community. I want us to reflect back on the scripture from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. The king and all the people. The people, the priests took their positions, as did the Levites and the Lord's musical instruments. The priests blew their trumpets, 
and the Israelites were all standing. Now in this verse, we can see the entire community has a part to play. The king plays his part and all the people play their part right along with them as they make sacrifices, offerings to the glory of God. The Israelites gave their first and best to God. They gave an unblemished firstborn animal quite often in their offerings. They, and when we give our tithes and our offerings each Sunday, we're giving in the same spirit. We, get, we play our part in holy community when we give our first and best for the glory of God. Notice in this story that the Levites played their musical instruments and the priests played their trumpets. Well... You got a band of musicians, don't you? You know, you got Frank and company leading you in music every Sunday morning. At the 1045 hour, Laura leads the choir and June plays the organ. Those who have the gift of music play their part in the community of worship. But what do the rest of us do? We sing. We sing. We join in too. Pastor Glenn has already reminded you of Wesley's rules for singing in the front of the hymnal. Do you remember that from last Sunday? Sing boldly and with good courage, not like you're afraid that somebody is going to hear you. Practice the singing in such a way that you blend with others. Keep in time with others. The practice of singing is especially formative. Not only does it draw your heart to God, but it causes you to have to listen to others. And that may pay some benefit in other parts of your life. Worship is community. Joining and singing joins your heart to God and to others. The king prayed. The musicians played and all the people stood on their feet in attentiveness to God. And God, the central member of this worshiping community, accepted their worship. The scripture says that fire came down from heaven and consumed the offering on the altar. And God moved into the temple with his mighty presence. The glory of the Lord is described in this passage as a thick cloud. A thick cloud. So intense was God's presence that the priests could not perform their duties. And all the people went face down to the ground in utter worship. Now, I don't know what your experience has been in worship. But there have been times in worship when the presence of God is so powerful that I've just been drawn to come to the altar and kneel. And sometimes wanting to go face flat before the Lord in worship. You know, when God is pleased with our worship, his presence can be manifested so powerfully that our eyes are filled with tears. Our hearts begin to burn with the fire of his love. And our bodies are renewed with his amazing peace. Can I have a witness to this at all? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Can I get an Amen. All right. Worship is community. We're bound to God. We're bound to each other through covenant, through the love of Jesus. And each of us have our part to play. And finally, we belong to God's redemptive story. The days of King Solomon were the high watermark in Israel's history. For 40 years, they enjoyed peace and untold prosperity like never before. Solomon, it said, made gold and silver in Jerusalem as common as clay pots. The queen of Sheba heard about the splendor and riches of Jerusalem and the unparalleled wisdom of Solomon. And so she came from a faraway place to see for herself. And when she got there, she was amazed. How did a country of freed slaves, freed slaves from Egypt, become so amazingly blessed? It is simple. God was with them. God was with them. God called Abraham and blessed him for his faith. He bound himself to Abraham and his descendants forever. He said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And when Abraham's descendants, only 70 of them, went down to Egypt, God blessed them and they became a multitude so vast that the Egyptians began to be afraid of them. So they oppressed them with harsh labor and slavery. And so God sent Moses and set them free. And God gave them the law and he bound himself to Israel through covenant. And Israel bound itself to God. 
And all through the wilderness, God provided for their needs and led them to the promised land. And God went before them in battle and drove out the pagan nations so that they could inherit the land. God rescued them when they were raided or attacked. And when they asked for a king, God appointed Saul and then David and now Solomon. But the story doesn't stop there. God's redeeming work continues. Solomon prayed that God would remember his promise to always have a son of David who would sit on the throne and rule Israel. And God's ultimate fulfillment of that promise is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah, the anointed one, king of kings and son of God. And Jesus established his church to transform the world with love. We belong to God's redemptive story because the story is not done yet. The story continues, and we belong to that story. Everything that God does is about blessing the world with the knowledge of God through holy communities like this one right here in Zionsville. We're part of a great story of redemption. The act of worship leads us out the doors of the sanctuary and into the world which God so loves. And as you play your part in worship, you are empowered by God to play your part in mission and continue the story. What is your part, you might ask yourself. You have resources and abilities to go out there and lift lives. You're empowered to live love, inspire hope, fill with faith, and transform our world. Begin simply by loving God through worship, loving God through daily devotions, loving God through giving. Begin simply by loving others through serving their needs and sharing with them your faith story. And love each other in this church by committing yourself to a small group de dedicated to growing as life lifters. Hold each other accountable to love and hold each other in love. Worship is a community, a community in Christ, bound to God and each other in love, playing out our part in glorifying God and transforming the world in God's ever unfolding redemption story. And you thought you were just coming to church today. What you're really doing is joining a community that celebrates the love of God. What you're really doing is playing your part in the drama of God's romance with this world. What you're doing is finding your way to fill the next chapter of God's mission to save the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together. Well, Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together and worship you. What a blessing and a privilege it is to be your people and to, to gather as one in the love of Jesus Christ. I pray, dear Lord, that as your word is proclaimed today, that your word would fill our hearts, that your grace would empower us, and we would leave this place renewed and ready to write some new words in the next chapter and the unfolding story of your great love through Jesus Christ. In his precious name we pray, amen.